Well, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. I am going to see if my slides will share properly. Give me just one second. Um, come on. Here we go. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen? All right, perfect, thank you. So good afternoon to so those of you who have joined today. Um, as Michael said, my name is Heidi Barham. I am the Manager of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion with Hospice of the Western Reserve located here in Northeast Ohio. And we cover pretty much all of the Northern part of Ohio stretching from the Pennsylvania to Indiana border. I've been with Hospice of Western Reserve for 15 years. I spent the first part of my career here as a spiritual care coordinator, which is a fancy word for chaplain, and did a lot of work with patients and families right at the bedside. I serve also as a church pastor in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and prior to a whole change in life, spent 20 years in the financial services industry. And most recently, I have been in the role as manager of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's still an opportunity for us to get information out to communities of color that are traditionally underrepresented in the numbers of those who receive hospice care. And so for those of us who are doing this work in this DEI space, it may not be readily apparent why we should be having a discussion today about hope and hospice and end of life care, but this is something that can have a profound impact on all of us as individuals, as well as on our families and within our communities, particularly when we recognize that death is the great equalizer. There may be diversity in how and when we go, coupled with inequities and in what happened to us before we go. But death is one of the few things in life that is completely inclusive. We will all have to go at some point in time. But why talk about this today? Well, as former First Lady Rosalind Carter is credited with saying, there are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who are caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And using that as our backdrop today, I just wanna talk about hospice and palliative care, which are vital resources that can and should be available to all of us who find ourselves on that caregiving continuum. But we'll also explore some of the reasons why these resources have traditionally been underutilized by persons within the African-American community. So just a few quick objectives. We'll look at the historical perspective of race and the impact of perceived healthcare disparities on end of life care. We'll examine the role of hospice and palliative care at the end of life. We'll look at factors that influence our decision-making as it relates to the end of life and explore some ways to overcome objections and barriers to accessing quality end of life care. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen these pictures before at some point in time in presentations. But I'll ask you just to think about real quickly, if you look at the picture on the left, do you see a rabbit or do you see a duck? Or perhaps you see both. And when you see the picture in the middle, is it a picture of a young woman looking to the left or an older woman looking down? To the right, do you see a saxophone player or do you see the image of a young woman? The point of this exercise is really just to demonstrate that people can have different perspectives on the same subject. We can all see the same thing and see it very differently. And a person's perceptions as it relates to whatever that subject or thing is we're looking at will become their reality, even if it's not the absolute truth. Now, just by way of offering a disclaimer before we move on, Although I do identify as African-American, I do not and cannot possibly speak for all persons from Black or African-American communities. The information we're going to talk about today may or may not apply to a specific individual or even a group of individuals we come into contact with. But the key is to hopefully share some insights on how a person's history and our culture influences our healthcare decisions, particularly as it relates to the end of life. Now, for many in the African-American community, accepting the need for hospice and palliative care at the end of life can be seen as a sign of giving up, as a demonstration of a lack of faith. There can be somewhat of a vicious circle that surrounds hospice care because 
Many patients and families wait until the last few days before they're willing to agree to a hospice level of care. And then the perception becomes that if you're receiving a hospice level of care, then you must be in your last few days. So the key is helping to shift the perspective so that patients and their families understand that hospice is not a death sentence. It is not simply the last step before the grave. Rather, it is a philosophy of care for the full length of that person's journey, whether that journey is measured in days, weeks, months, or even years. It also means helping people understand that moving to a hospice level of care does not mean relinquishing someone's prayer for hope or for healing. Now, this is not a concern that's unique to African-Americans. It's often difficult to bridge that gap and help people from all backgrounds, except that healing can come in many forms. For some, it can be helpful to reframe the discussion and talk about the perfect healing, which may not actually come on this side of heaven or wherever they view eternity. But one of the challenges within the African-American community in particular comes with reconciling the desire to hold on to faith while trying to establish a relationship with a medical community that has not always done the best job of instilling trust. As we look at meeting the needs of African-American patients and families, it's important to stress the idea that hospice care and a person's faith or spirituality work hand in hand. This is not an either or proposition. Hope and hospice are not mutually exclusive. They are not opposite ends of a spectrum. Now there's a quote from the late Reverend Frank Jackson who was a pastor at Faith Presbyterian Church. And he said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. He went on to say that it is not so much the act of dying itself, but the things that are surrounding death, injustice, poverty, mistreatment, and evil. There's a sense that we won't be stopped by those things. Our somehow theology, somehow, some way, we will get through this. Ingrained in this thought is the notion that we as a people have learned to get through everything else life has thrown at us on our own. And we will get through this death thing on our own as well. And many of us look and say, we won't need anybody else's help to make it through. Now, fortunately, as a result of this somehow theology, some patients and families hear the word hospice and immediately the walls go up. There's a member of my own family who was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer and was given a six week prognosis. And one of his siblings asked me to talk to him about hospice care and his response was absolutely not. I am not ready to just lay down and die. I plan to fight. And while he did outlive that six week prognosis by a couple of months, he spent much of that time in the hospital struggling and in pain. And despite our efforts to help him understand he did not have to suffer, he just could not relinquish the idea that accepting the help that hospice could provide was tantamount to him giving up hope in his fight to live. But it's important for us to understand that allowing hospice care at the end of life is not a surrendering of hope. Far from being something that we have to fight through or somehow get through on our own. When it comes to the end of life, being open to receiving hospice care is the acceptance of a gift that allows us to make the most out of the life we've been blessed with and to do it with dignity and the respect we deserve so that we can find comfort and peace at the end of life. Now in an article that was published on the Christian Century website, the author Amy Frycomb quoted comedian and activist Dick Gregory, who after sitting through a presentation on African-Americans and hospice care, maybe something even like what we're doing today, he said, so now they want us to get comfortable with dying? Well, if Mr. Gregory was still with us today, my answer to him would be yes. We do want people to get comfortable with dying because the odds are 100% against any one of us getting away with not dying. It is one of the few things in life that is guaranteed to happen to all of us, regardless of our race, ethnicity, cultural background, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, political affiliation, or spiritual belief. The issue for us then becomes how do we face death when the time comes? Now, obviously, when someone dies in a tragic accident or is the victim of a homicide or other criminal activity, that's a very different matter. But when we talk about death and dying as it relates to hospice care, our goal is absolutely to help people get comfortable with dying. 
Now, it has been said that we have to meet people where they are. And that involves respecting who they are while also honoring where they have come from. We cannot negate the fact that the African-American experience has been shaped at least in part by a history of racism and discrimination, a legacy of slavery along with abuses involving medical experimentation, economic and legal injustices and racial profiling. This has led to many African-Americans having an innate distrust of the healthcare system as a result of what has been called out as medical racism. Some people have voiced fear of receiving inferior care if they do things that other people often take for granted, like asking questions of their healthcare providers or signing advanced care directives or registering to become an organ donor. So I thought an abbreviated historical review might help put some things in perspective as we consider some of the factors that contribute to the discomfort felt by persons within the African community, African American community when it comes to the subject of death and dying. And this seems to be an even more important thing to do, this type of review, especially in light of efforts that are currently underway to simply sweep our history under the carpet. But I want us to keep in mind, this is just an overview of some of the highlights on a timeline that spans from slavery to civil rights. And so in 1619, we see the first enslaved persons came over from Africa and arrived in Virginia. In 1787, slavery was made illegal in the Northwest Territory. But then in 1793, the Fugitive Slave Law was enacted. In 1820, the Missouri Compromise banned slavery north of the southern border of Missouri. 1857, the Dred Scott decision held that Congress does not have the right to ban slavery in the states and furthermore that enslaved persons are not citizens. Then in 1861, the Confederacy was founded when the states in the Deep South seceded and the Civil War began. And despite any reports to the contrary, the issue at the heart of the Civil War was indeed slavery and the economic impact that losing the free labor of enslaved persons would have on the country. In 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation that declared enslaved persons were free. However, the persons who were enslaved in Texas did not learn they had been freed until 1865, two years after the fact, on June 19th. And it was not until June of 2021 that Juneteenth, the day that commemorates the ending of slavery in the United States, finally became a federal holiday. Now, 1865 was a pretty busy year. The Freedmen's Bureau was established, the Civil War ended, the 13th Amendment was ratified outlawing slavery, but then President Lincoln is assassinated and the Ku Klux Klan was formed and the Black Codes were implemented. And these were strict local and state laws that detailed when, where, and how formerly enslaved people could work, how much compensation they could receive. And these codes appeared throughout the South as a means of legally putting the recently freed black citizens into indentured servitude, taking away their voting rights, controlling where they lived and how they traveled as well as seizing their children for labor purposes. Then in 1868, the 14th Amendment was ratified which defined citizenship and declared formerly enslaved persons were citizens. And in 1870, the 15th Amendment gave blacks the right to vote. And in 1896, the landmark Supreme Court decision, Plessy v. Ferguson, held that racial discrimination was constitutional and paved the way for the repressive Jim Crow laws that picked up where the Black codes left off. They were meant to marginalize African Americans, denying them the right to vote, to hold jobs, to get an education, or avail themselves of other opportunities. These laws started in the South but spread across the country, and anyone who attempted to defy these laws were faced with arrest, jail sentences, violence, and even death. Now we'll talk about the Tuskegee experiment in a moment, but as we move toward the mid 20th century and beyond, we do begin to see some signs of hope and progress. President Truman integrated the armed forces. Brown versus Board of Education declared racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional and President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. But keep in mind, I said some signs of progress because unfortunately, nearly 60 years after the enactment of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, there've been concerted efforts to again restrict access to voting with a disproportionate impact being felt by communities of color. We cannot ignore the fact that there has been this intensified effort, at least on the part of some, to try and negate the critical importance of all this history in a vain effort to minimize the lasting effects it has had on all of us. <laughs> 
Now, we cannot pretend as if the impact our collective history has had on community of colors, of color, excuse me, is simply an issue for those particular communities to handle. If there's going to be any lasting change, it will take all of us working together. Because in the words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., all men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. Simply put, we are all in this together. But sadly, despite the enactment of the civil rights legislation in the 1960s and all the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and all those civil rights activists of his day, abuses against many in the African-American community have continued. The Tuskegee experiment was just one such abuse, arising from the belief that the high mortality rate and incidence of disease among African-Americans was proof that Blacks were biologically inferior to whites. In 1932, the Public Health Service and Tuskegee Institute began a study entitled Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. And it used 600 black men, 399 with advanced syphilis and 201 without it, and was designed to record the natural progression of the disease in hopes of justifying treatment programs for blacks. But there was no informed consent. Participants were told they were being treated for bad blood, but they did not receive proper treatment. What they got was medical exams, free meals, and burial insurance. The study was initially scheduled to last six months, but if you can do the math, it went on for 40 years. In 1945, penicillin became the accepted treatment of choice for syphilis, but was not given to the participants in the study, and it went on for another 37 years. Back in 1974, a $10 million out of court settlement was reached and the government promised to give lifetime medical benefits and burial services to all the living participants. The last one of whom died in 2004 and the last widow receiving benefits died in 2009. Now, while many people are really familiar with the Tuskegee experiment, Virginia tobacco farmer Henrietta Lacks was not as well known, at least not until her story began to spread in large part due to the publication of a book by a journalist named Rebecca Skloot and a subsequent HBO film that was executive produced by Oprah Winfrey, both entitled The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was diagnosed with cervical cancer in February of 1951 and a tissue sample taken from her tumor without her permission, without her family's permission, the doctors used this tissue to do research and the cells taken from that tumor ultimately claimed her life only eight months later. These cells have been named HeLa, representing the first two letters of her first and last name. Now these cells were believed to be the first immortal human cells ever grown in culture and have been multiplying and used for medical research around the world. They've been sent into space to see how they react in zero gravity. They've been used for research into cancer, AIDS, gene mapping, and other scientific pursuits, including the development of the polio vaccine. They've even aided in producing a vaccine and reducing HPV infections and subsequent instances of cervical cancer in women and girls, the very cancer that took Henrietta Lacks' life in the first place. And while some Lacks family members served as paid consultants on the Oprah Winfrey film, as a whole, neither Henrietta Lacks nor her family received any compensation directly connected to the research that has been done using her cells. Rebecca Skloot, the author of the book, did donate some of her initial royalties back in 2010 to start the Lacks Family Foundation. And while there are reports of some corporate and individual donors who've made contributions to that foundation, there are still legal battles being waged in the courts while the family continues to fight for justice. Whew, that historical snapshot may be a lot to digest, but it's important for us to recognize how our shared history has such a profound impact to this day on how persons from communities of color interact with the medical community, including when it comes to end of life care. In light of the Tuskegee experiment and the story of Henrietta Lacks, as well as other stories like these, including Dr. J. Marion Sims, the so-called father of gynecology who used slave women as lab rats. It should not seem too far-fetched for African-Americans to believe they can still be used as guinea pigs. 
Keep in mind, perception becomes reality, even if it isn't the absolute truth. And as we fast forward to the present, we can probably recall how the COVID-19 pandemic collided with the heightened tensions brought on by the killings that fuel the Black Lives Matter movement. Even now, we continue to say the names of Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and so many others, up to and including Tyree Nichols. Now, while all of this has brought much needed attention to the inequities and disparities that still exist when it comes to access to healthcare, education, and social and economic resources within communities of color, we still have a long way to go. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has done is shine a light on what could be labeled as a pre-existing condition of racial inequality that still persists within the Black community. This is evidenced by the CDC data provided here, which indicates that with the exception of the Asian community, communities of color continue to be more negatively impacted by COVID-19 as it relates to number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So clearly there is still much work that needs to be done. But now let's shift gears a little and talk about what matters most as we approach the end of life. In a survey conducted by the AARP in North Carolina, at least 80% of African-American respondents rated the following as being very important in dealing with their own dying. Being at peace spiritually, not being a burden, knowing medication was available when it was needed, getting honest answers from their doctors and healthcare providers, having things settled with their families, being physically comfortable, understanding the treatment options available to them, and being free from pain. One thing I think is important to point out is that all of these end of life needs that were expressed as being very important are consistent with a hospice level of care. And while the majority of persons surveyed rated being at peace spiritually as a very important aspect of dying, African-American respondents were more likely to say it than not. More than 90% of the African-American respondents rated themselves as at least somewhat spiritual or religious compared to 83% of non-African-Americans. So it should not be all that surprising that there's a strong desire to hold on to faith at the end of life. So if the things that matter most at the end of life are the focus of what hospice care is all about, what is responsible for the racial disparities we see when it comes to choosing hospice and end-of-life care? A report published in 2020 came about as a result of a collaborative effort with researchers from several medical schools, including Johns Hopkins, Mount Sinai, University of Alabama at Birmingham, and Cornell. And the researchers examined racial and regional differences in end-of-life outcomes. I want to highlight just a couple of the key findings that stood out. According to the report, Black patients voluntarily sought substantially more intensive treatment, as well as made multiple ER visits in the last six months of life, while white patients more often chose hospice services. And that more aggressive treatment included mechanical ventilation, gastronomy or G-tube insertion, CPR, et cetera. Of the roughly 1,200 persons studied, only about 35% of the Blacks who died used hospice services for three days or more compared to 46% of whites, which equates to Blacks being almost 25% less likely to use hospice services for more than those last 48 to 72 hours, which feeds back into that vicious circle of people thinking that if you're under hospice care, it means you must only have a day or two left. Now, one of the researchers in the study noted that despite an overall increase nationwide in the use of hospice care, the disparities regarding the utilization of hospice care by Black patients and families is persistent and is not decreasing over time. Some of the explanations that were suggested included a lack of trust in the medical system, which in turn leads to a reduced willingness to forego life-sustaining measures, even if a person has a terminal diagnosis with a limited prognosis. Years ago, I read about an older African-American gentleman who was asked by healthcare providers if he had completed his advanced directives and if he had considered hospice care. He responded to their questions with a question. Would you be asking me this if I was younger and white? There's a misperception that hospice care is recommended to persons of color to avoid providing them with better healthcare options that might be offered to persons who are not from communities of color. But there's also a poor communication line between Black patients and healthcare professionals. 
And so we need to be willing to ask questions of healthcare providers and continue asking questions and we t until we get answers that make sense. We need to do research ahead of time as much as possible in preparing for appointments. And we should not let ourselves be intimidated or fall prey to what some call white coat syndrome. Doctors may have degrees behind their names, but as my grandmother would say, they still put their pants on one leg at a time. But the onus is not all on the patient. Providers should be intentional about allowing adequate time for patients to digest the information that is being given to them. And then make sure they understand what has been told to them. So the providers need to do like teach bags, ask clarifying questions, make sure their patients understand the news you have just given them. But we also need to be aware of cultural and spiritual differences that may impact decisions regarding life-sustaining treatment. This goes back to that somehow theology that God will make a way somehow. We have to keep in mind, faith plays a substantial role for many within the African-American community. And many times that brings with it the hope that a miracle can still happen. And that can make it more difficult for the patient and family to agree to transitioning to a hospice or palliative level of care. Then there's insufficient access to higher quality end of life care. Some may attribute this to a lack of understanding of how to gain access to care. Given some people may operate under the false assumption that they cannot afford hospice care, but it could also be the result of providers not informing patients and families about end of life care, either from their own level of discomfort with having the conversations or their own reluctance to accept that they have done all that they can or should do in providing curative treatment. And then there's also low health literacy that results in less advanced care planning. This can also be a consequence of healthcare providers being unwilling to engage in difficult conversations and not explaining the importance of having advanced care directives in place. And one issue that comes up consistently is the fact that fewer African Americans have their advanced directives, their durable power of attorney for healthcare or their living will. And this then leads to them being more likely to receive an aggressive level of care that may not be consistent with their wishes. In situations where a person cannot speak for themselves, absent documents stating otherwise or appointing a medical proxy, persons who are hospitalized may receive aggressive forms of treatment that they might not have otherwise consented to. One study showed that 66% of people in one survey said they would not want to be on life support, but only 30% had advanced directives. So if we don't put our wishes in writing, we cannot realistically expect for those wishes to be followed. I will also say we need to revisit and review those documents that spell out our wishes periodically with our family as well as with our providers to ensure they understand what our wishes are. We also need to make sure they know where those documents are located before a crisis arises. And let me just say this, it is not sufficient to say, oh, my loved ones know what I want. Disagreements can lead families into court arguing over what big mama would have wanted or what daddy would have wanted or what our children would want. Now, as it relates to hospice and palliative care services, we would do well to seek out opportunities to educate ourselves, our families and our communities about the services that are available and the benefits associated with those services. And one of those benefits is pain management. The palliation or alleviation of symptoms, particularly pain, is a key component of hospice care. One of the challenges, however, is that for many within the African American community, access to certain medications, particularly narcotics, that can adequately address pain and other symptoms is limited. Lack of access to the medications patients need can be due to insufficient financial resources to pay for them. But it can also be attributed to some pharmacies not even carrying certain medications in particular neighborhoods. According to one study, pharmacies in white neighborhoods were up to three times more likely to carry opiates to treat pain than pharmacies in non-white neighborhoods. For some people, it can become a matter of rationing their medication to ensure that something, that anything will be available at a later time if they need it. Another benefit, however, of hospice services is the provision of the medications that address symptoms such as pain and shortness of breath so patients don't feel the, the need to ration their medicines. Now, there can also be a fear for some of becoming addicted to pain medicine, and that fear often outweighs the possibility of actually having their pain relieved. After all, for many in the African American community, suffering is sometimes seen simply as a fact of life. Now, when we talk about the healthcare system, one thing that we cannot minimize 
is the impact that bias has on our encounters. It has been said that it takes only seven seconds to make a first impression. So who do you see? And who do you think the healthcare provider see? Keep in mind, first impressions in healthcare can be a key component to providing a good experience for patients. Implicit bias can have a detrimental impact on patient and provider relationships, and it will only serve to further exacerbate the distrust in the healthcare system. Now, it's sad to say that many healthcare providers would probably not look at this man and initially see a colleague. And for some, even the lab coat with his name and credential stitched on it would not be enough to garner the same degree of respect that would be afforded to someone who was not a person of color. It brings to mind the story of Dr. Susan Moore in Indiana, who died from COVID because she did not receive the medical treatment she needed, despite the attending physician knowing that she too was a physician and was well aware of the treatment that would have addressed the severe symptoms she was having. Unfortunately, there are some physicians and other healthcare providers whose personal biases and prejudices can have a negative impact on the quality of care they deliver, including the undertreatment of symptoms, including pain and shortness of breath. Some surveys have shown that as many as 50% of white medical students believe the myth that Black people have thicker skin and have less sensitive nerve endings than white people and feel pain less acutely than others. These biases can also affect the ability or willingness of providers to discuss critical issues with patients, including their preferences as it relates to end of life care. But is it, it is important for us to note that we all have biases. The key is in how we allow our biases to influence the ways we treat other people. And one of the tools that can be used to help us identify our own biases is at the website for Project Implicit. And if you've not taken any of their implicit association tests, I would encourage you to do so. The results can be eye-opening. So as we think about hospice and palliative care, the focus is on caring for the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. It encompasses all of who a person is, where they've come from, as well as what they may have been through. And a person's faith and spirituality are an integral part of who they are, and that must be respected and honored. It should, not be it should be incorporated as a key component of the plan of care and not simply be dismissed as inconsequential or unimportant. Hospice and palliative care does not mean the stripping away of the things that patients and families value most, particularly as it relates to someone's faith and spirituality. Now, in my former role as a spiritual care coordinator, I would look for ways to honor the patient and their family and the faith or spiritual traditions that were most meaningful for them. But this is actually not something that's just the job of a chaplain or a spiritual care coordinator. It's something every member of the care team should honor as well. But another very critical component of providing hospice care is to honor and show respect to those patients and families who do not adhere to a faith tradition or identify as being spiritual. A truly holistic approach to hospice and palliative care is about honoring all of who a person is. And no patient or family should ever be made to feel less than because their beliefs may not happen to line up with ours. Now, when we talk about faith and spirituality, it is not just about religion. A person's religious traditions are just one part of how they may express their spirituality and what informs their faith. The hospice spiritual care coordinator or chaplain's role is not to be a replacement for someone's pastor, priest, rabbi, or imam, or other spiritual leader, but to work in conjunction with them to provide a level of care that allows a person's faith and spirituality to be incorporated into the comprehensive plan of care. So let's think about some of the factors that come into play when it is time to make critical decisions regarding our health care, particularly as it relates to the end of life and what can account for the disparities we see. One is a mistrust of the healthcare system. Coupled with what we've already heard regarding abuses suffered at the hands of the medical community, studies have shown that African-Americans are more likely to report communication with physicians as being either absent or problematic. They're also more likely to have concerns about being kept informed about their loved ones or their own conditions at the end of life. Because of limitations in access to health care, many African-Americans have a lack of continuity in their care providers. Consequently, the patient does not always see the same physician, 
and has not had an opportunity to have ongoing conversations regarding preferences as it relates to aggressive treatment versus palliative or comfort care at the end of life. When they're seen by a new doctor in an emergency situation, the doctors tend to err on the side of aggressive treatment rather than be seen as withholding life prolonging treatment. Then there's the lack of education and health literacy. Studies have found that there's a very strong link between health literacy and the reduction of disparities in end of life care. For example, one study found that after viewing a video about the final stages of dementia, something that affects African Americans twice as much as persons who are not from the African American community, the differences in the distribution of end of life care preferences that were previously noted virtually disappeared. You know, there is that old adage, when we know better, we do better. But we cannot negate the impact of a lack of adequate resources. Within communities of color, there's often a lack of access to supportive services like pharmacies and home care services that are actually an integral part of hospice care. So one thing we must do a better job of is educating people on the fact that hospice services, all of them are generally covered by Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurances. Now, as it relates to advanced care directives, multiple studies have found that Black and Hispanic patients in particular are less likely to have advanced care directives in place and are more likely to want life prolonging care, even if they only have a few days left to live. Some estimates indicate that Blacks are only half as likely as whites to have advanced care directives in place and are twice as likely as whites to choose a full code status, meaning the likelihood that they will request that all medical means be implemented to preserve their lives despite having received a terminal diagnosis. Now, I must add here, there's also this false perception that having one's advanced care directives in place will allow your loved ones to take your possessions or prematurely end your life, that is not true. Now, one study found that African-Americans were more likely to consider religion to be very important and were less likely to acknowledge their terminally ill status. They were also significantly less likely to want a physician to disclose their prognosis than white patients. It's the don't tell me and it won't happen syndrome. Newsflash, even if we don't tell you, it's still going to happen. Now, a different article suggested that many within the African-American community have a very strong faith connection and believe that to discuss end of life care or make any plans ahead of time regarding funeral arrangements is inviting the patient's death to happen. The assumption or presumption that planning equates to giving up. Some would rather pray for a miracle than accept that a disease is in its terminal stage. Now, because death can be viewed as a transition, not a final state. Many will equate being right with God with having a good death experience. So they may not recognize the need for or the benefit of hospice services. So what can we do to overcome the objections and barriers that might result in us not accepting or accessing hospice and palliative care? Well, one thing we can do is increase the awareness of the disparities. So we have to keep having the discussions and acknowledge that Disparities in healthcare and access to hospice care do exist, and then be intentional in seeking ways to eliminate them. And one of the ways we do that is by providing opportunities for cross cultural education within healthcare settings and among providers, and also to be intentional in focusing efforts on collaborating with faith communities. Studies have found that within the African American community, people can be twice as likely to talk to their clergy person as to their doctor about their end of life wishes. So working with clergy and other spiritual and community leaders can help us to make inroads with people. It can be extremely beneficial for us to recognize and honor the relationship people have with their faith communities and view it as a point of connection rather than something to be discounted. For healthcare providers and practitioners to garner trust, they have to be active participants in the life of the community. More and more churches have established or are establishing ministries that are specifically designed to help people approach death and dying and assist them with making plans for the end of life. So having hospice and palliative care providers partner with these ministries can be extremely helpful for the patients, their families, the faith communities, as well as the hospice providers. Now we also in working in partnership with faith communities and other community organizations, 
we need to provide education on the benefits of hospice and palliative care. Explain what hospice care is and what it is not. Emphasize the benefits of hospice that will address a patient or family's concerns. For example, that services can be delivered in the home. Hospice is a level of care, not a place that they have to go to. There's 24 hour phone support available. They are not in this journey alone. And hospice will provide for durable medical equipment and medications that are reported related to a patient's primary diagnosis. And most of those costs are covered by Medicare, Medicaid, and most private insurances. But we also need to work to foster a sense of trust and open communication between minority communities and healthcare providers. And this cannot be done, however, without engaging in honest dialogue, acknowledging that cultural differences do exist, and then working to ensure cultural sensitivity is evidenced in our interactions. This can go a long way in improving trust among African Americans with their doctors in the healthcare system, which may in turn then lead to an increased use of hospice services when they're recommended. In his position paper, COVID-19 and Supporting Black Communities at the End of Life, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization included the following statement. Inclusion is accomplished not by telling communities what they should do, but through establishing trusting relationships. And establishing trust is a continual process that takes time and intention. It takes only an instant to lose someone's trust. It can take a lifetime to rebuild it, especially if we're not willing to put in the work to make it happen. We also need to promote diversity and cultural competence with our healthcare providers. Physicians and nurse practitioners are the ones responsible for deciding when a hospice level of care is appropriate and writing the order for care. So we need to assure that cultural education is offered to these providers to help foster that open communication and dialogue with their patients and families as it relates to the need for and the benefits of hospice care. Providing culturally competent health care involves that provider acknowledging their own diverse values and beliefs and being able to integrate them in a way that is sensitive to people from other cultures. We also need to ensure that hospice programs and healthcare programs in general are culturally relevant to the people being served. And then we need to establish a presence within minority neighborhoods. Community outreach strategies should be designed to ensure patients and their families have the necessary access to information about hospice and palliative care programs to eliminate knowledge deficits and misconceptions. So providers should do things like create culturally relevant messages that are geared toward the African-American community, acknowledging the importance of family and faith, emphasizing that they're there to help care for and take care of their families, to show respect and dignity. And we also need to build trusting relationships with community leaders within our social centers, like our church pastors and local political leaders and educators and provide culturally specific literature in our neighborhood gathering places. Let's be real, everybody goes to the barbershop and the beauty shop. We got folks at senior centers and religious institutions. So those are the places we need to be providing information. Now, as we continue and have these critical and courageous conversations and align ourselves with our patients and families and members of the faith community, people will begin to gain a greater appreciation for the fact that hope and hospice care can coexist and see that they are not mutually exclusive. Hospice does not mean giving up hope. It is more a matter of changing our perspective on what we are hoping for, shifting from hope for a cure when that is no longer possible to hope for peace, comfort, and dignity for whatever time we may have left. I had a conversation with one of the nurses on our teams a while ago who was caring for an African-American patient who was the mother of nine children. And the nurse had asked the primary caregiver if they had given the patient permission to let go. And the daughter told the nurse that they had not and would not because they were not giving up hope. And this was despite the obvious indicators that the patient was approaching the end of her life. Now I had a relationship with the family outside of our hospice care team and through our church connection. And so I reached out to one of her sons and we talked about our shared faith and our hope for eternity. He described his mother as being the one who helped shape the faith of her children as they were growing up. He talked about going to church together as a family and how even now, although mom was not talking, eating or drinking, 
they continued to pray and read scripture to her. And that's when I broached the subject of giving his mom permission to let go. And just like his sister had said to the nurse, he said he had not had that conversation and he wasn't about to because he still had hope. But even as he said this, he acknowledged that her condition had declined significantly. And we talked about what it means to hold on to hope. And I asked him about the ultimate hope that informs our faith as it relates to eternity. And then I asked him if our hope is in an eternity beyond this life, why wouldn't we want our loved ones to receive the gift that we say we are ultimately hoping for? That's when he said he realized they were being selfish because they just wanted to hold on to their mom as long as they could. And let's be honest, who could blame them? You see, in my work in hospice, as well as a church pastor, I realized this is not an easy conversation for people to have with their loved ones. But I've also witnessed how much peace it gives to someone to hear their loved ones say, it's okay. And that's what I shared with my friend. And less than 48 hours later, he called to tell me his mom had died. And that the day before she did, he had told her it was okay. I assured him he had given his mom a precious gift. For people who are dealing with a life-limiting illness, particularly within the African-American community, their faith may be the only thing they have left to hold on to. And for a people who have traditionally and historically had much more taken away than they've ever been given, our goal should be to help them hold on to the one thing that no one should ever try to take away. And when we can help people to see that hope and hospice really do go hand in hand, they in turn become some of our best ambassadors. Because I will tell you, in just two weeks after his mom passed away, my friend had already referred three of his friends for services. Now, what I've come to appreciate in doing this work is that you cannot spell hospice without hope. Because when all is said and done, hospice really is all about hope and holding on to faith at the end of life. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I know Amber is going to send you the slides. It has contact information and resource information. But I also wanted to check and see if there were any questions and to thank you for your attention.